This is part three of six of our video series on the introduction to programming. In this video, we look at subroutines, procedures and functions. So what actually is a subroutine? Well, it's nothing more than a block of code given a unique, identifiable name within a program. We use subroutines to help us break down a larger problem into a series of smaller, more manageable problems, thus making the code easier to write, debug and reuse. The word subroutine is a generic term, and in a broad sense it covers two concepts you need to know about. Procedures, those are blocks of code that carry out a set task, and functions, blocks of code that carry out a set task and, in addition, return a value. If you're thinking about object-orientated programming, we still have procedures and functions, but in that context they're referred to as methods. Methods can either return a value or not return a value, and so you can think of them in very similar terms. But let's just have a brief look at a program here. The first thing you will notice is there are multiple blocks of code or subroutines. In fact, we have four. In the exam, you'll be able to spot subroutines as they will start with either the word procedure or function and end with either end procedure or end function. After the initial word, you can then see a name is given to that procedure or function, which uniquely identifies it in the program. So this program has four procedures called initialize, output one, output two, and adjust. You'll notice the actual main program starts down the bottom. And this is quite typical that the blocks of code, the subroutines are written at the top of the program and your main program starts towards the end. So when we actually run this program, it starts at this line, or strictly speaking, this is a comment, so it will start at the next line. The very first line of code in this program, therefore, is initialize, open brackets, close brackets. This is what we call a procedure call, a call to another procedure. As soon as the program hits this line of code, it searches for a subroutine with the same name, and then it jumps to the code inside that subroutine. The program carries on executing the code in that subroutine until it reaches the end, at which point it returns to the place where it left off originally. So in this case, we go back to the main part of the program at the bottom there, and we continue with the next line, which is the while line. In a similar fashion, you can see the main program contains three other calls to procedures. And again, each time we hit one of those, we would jump off to the appropriate subroutine, execute the code inside it, and then return. In this way, you'll notice the actual main program itself now has very little code. It has some logic in the form of a while loop, but most of the code is actually contained elsewhere in blocks of code. This is a typical way of programming. OK, so now we've gone over the basics. Let's actually look at a worked example of procedures and functions in the following Python program. So a quick recap then. We have two main types of subroutines. There's procedures that carry out a task and functions that carry out a task and return a value. So the first thing to notice here with this program is it actually starts towards the very bottom of the code listing under the comments where it says main program. The rest of the program is constructed of blocks or subroutines. Now you'll notice one of the very first lines of code that's run is print output throw. Output throw is a call to a subroutine. So what happens is when we reach output throw, we search the rest of the code for a subroutine with a matching name. 
we find one. And so the code jumps to that section of the program and starts executing in sequence from that point on. When the program reaches the end, we can see it says return a value, return the contents of the variable role. At this point, the program jumps back to where it left off before it entered this subroutine. Because we're returning a value, we know that this subroutine is actually a function. You will notice that as part of executing the function output throw, we also have a call to another subprogram, roll a dice. So again, we would jump off at that point to the subroutine roll a dice. And we can see again here that roll a dice returns a value, thus again making this a function. Again, a little bit further in the output throw function, we see another call to a subroutine, this one called order dice. So as soon as we hit that line of code, the program jumps off to the order dice subroutine and starts executing the code in there. Again, depending on the result of the if statement, if D1 is greater than or equal to D2, we hit one of two return statements. One or the other is going to get executed. And when we do that, we'll jump back into the output throw function. And of course, once again, because order dice returns a value, this is a function and not a procedure. So what are the advantages then of using subroutines such as those shown? Well, programs are easier to write and they're easier to debug. It creates reusable components. These functions can also be grouped in a library for easy reuse across many different programs. Indeed, you do that in this program here, and you may have done something similar in your own programs. The first line of code says import random, and this imports the random library of functions into our program so we can then make use of them. Finally, programs are simply easier to test if they're written in modules and blocks of code. Here we can see how subprograms are called from inside flowcharts. There's a specific symbol used in flowcharts which tells you that you need to jump off and start executing another flowchart. And when you reach the end of that flowchart, you'd return from the one that called it and carried on. So this is the flowchart for the previous program we showed you in Python. Pause the video for a second and just work through it slowly so you can see how you jump back and forwards between the different flowcharts as they're being called. Now the example we work through here is in Python and you may well be using a different language at A level such as C Sharp or Java. But it's worth pointing out the format that procedures and functions will be displayed in in the OCR exams. So here you can see the syntax that they will use for a procedure and indeed for a function. So having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. What is the difference between a procedure and a function? We're just going to go over a quick note now about the language guide that's used in your external assessments. So remember, the exam board don't know what language you've been learning to program, so exam questions might use an unfamiliar syntax. Towards the back of the specification for both AS and A level, you'll find Appendix 5D, where the exam board state the following guide shows the format pseudocode will appear in the examined components. It's provided to allow you to give learners familiarity before the exam. Learners are not expected to memorise the syntax of the pseudocode and when asked may provide answers in any style of pseudocode they choose, providing its meaning could be reasonably inferred by a competent programmer. So although you don't have to answer in the specific syntax shown in the exam papers, 
so you are familiar and not thrown in the exam, it's worth downloading a copy of the specification and printing out the appendix. If your school is a Craig and Day subscriber, then ask your teacher for a copy of our student learning and exam support guide. This provides all the information you need in a set of handy reference sheets.